Uh, today, we are going to be continuing on in our Book of Romans study. Amen. And uh, it's, it's been a very, very encouraging study, and prayerfully, I, I hope that you've been getting a lot out of it and uh, have been applying it to your life. But uh, today, we're going to be picking it up in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Amen. Now, if you were to outline Romans chapter 12 and 13, verses 1 through 8 of Romans 12 would be living sacrifices. Verses 9 through 21 of chapter 12 would be daily living. And verse 1 of 7 of chapter 13, living lawfully. And then chapter 13, verse 8 through 14, living to live again. Let's start off in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Come on, Evan. Right here is Paul is speaking to the church at Rome. A church dominated by Jews, although living in a Gentile city. He starts off chapter 12 and he goes, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. You know, I think for a lot of people, they think worshiping God is just showing up to church and singing some really good music. And that is partly part of our worship to God. But worship encompasses far more than that. And right here, Paul is talking to the church and goes, Hey guys, in order for you to worship God, you've got to make yourself a living sacrifice. For this is your spiritual act of worship. Amen. And that is our title today. Spiritual acts of worship. Amen. But you know, you've got to ask yourself, why does Paul say, therefore? I mean, every time you see the word therefore, you've got to figure out what the therefore is there for. <laughs> so, so, so what is he saying right here? What are he saying? In light of everything we've already studied out. So in chapter 1 through 3, we learn that everybody is lost. The Gentiles were lost because they chose sin over God. And in the rebellion, God gave them over to it. Yeah. We learn that the Jews are lost because they tried to live perfectly according to the law, but they fell short. Right. Right. And so if the Jews are lost and the Gentiles are lost, everybody's lost and needs Jesus. Yeah. Then in chapter 4, we learn how to have faith like our father in the faith, Abraham. Amen. A faith that not only intellectually believes in God, but goes where God tells them to go, to obey God. In chapter 5 and 6, we learn what it meant to be justified. That when we're forgiven of our sins, we're justified just as if I'd never sinned. Amen. Isn't that encouraging right there? I know that fires up Bobby a lot, amen, because he's got a lot of sins. In chapter 7 and 8, we learn how to be more than conquerors. That the Spirit literally intercedes for us. And speaks to God on our behalf. Not only does the Spirit intercede for us, but Jesus Himself is sitting at Jesus or God's right hand and is communicating to God on our behalf. That, that was an encouraging lesson. Yeah. But then in chapters 9 through 11, we studied out the sovereignty of God. Remember, there is a God, and I am not Him. Right. And God has a plan, and His plan is perfect. And who are we to question God? We are just the clay. God is the potter. Amen. But right here, Paul goes, in view of all these things, in view of the fact that everybody's lost. In view of the fact that we need Jesus to be justified, in view of the fact that God is sovereign, make ourselves a living sacrifice. This is our spiritual act of worship. Yeah. You know, when I was in uh, Hawaii, I'll never forget, uh, for about a year, Kelly and I lived in uh, sort of this, this old wood shop uh, that my parents owned because we were trying to build our house and we couldn't afford to pay uh, for the building of the house and also our current rent. And so we lived in this place. Uh, we got to live there for free and everything like that. But it was, it was pretty much like a dungeon. And uh, it was okay. I mean, we, we pushed through for a lot of months. Uh, but towards the end there, we started to have a problem with mice. And I'll never forget, I mean, we're sitting there having a talk. And we're trying to have a, uh, spend some time together. And out of the corner of my eye, I just see something just move across the room. You ever have that happen to you before? And uh, so it caught my eye. And I looked over. And right when I looked over, Kelly looked over too. And we see two more little mice scurrying across the corner of the room. I go, oh, my gosh. It was like 10.30 at night already, but we're like, we've we, we got to deal with the mice problem. So we went down to Walmart, and we bought some. We're, we're going to buy the snap traps, but my wife, you know, she just didn't have the heart. She didn't have the heart to kill the mice. So we, we, we compromised, and we settled on the glue traps. So, so we get home, and we put the glue traps out all over our floor, and we go, okay, well, hopefully this gets on. We go to sleep. About 2 o'clock in the morning, we hear, <laughs> So I get up, I turn on the lights, and sure enough, there's this one giant mouse, and his back two legs are stuck to the glue trap, and his front legs are just pushing around the whole room with his front legs. 
I go, this is intense. Then we also learned that there's a problem with the glue traps. Mice, when they're caught in the glue traps, they like to bite themselves to try to free themselves off the trap. So they're literally blooding themselves by chewing on their own legs and feet. So that was a little bit more intense than just a quick snap. But see, I was thinking about this. I was going, you know, when you're about to die, there's a survivor mode that kicks on with you. And like the mice, we try to scurry ourselves off the altar. See, that's the problem with the living sacrifice. We like to try to sperm off the altar before we get sacrificed. You with me right here, guys? And that's what God is telling us we have to be as disciples. You have to make yourself a living sacrifice. You have to voluntarily put yourself on the altar of God. Give up yourself for the Lord. You with me right here, guys? Let's read on to verse 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. See, that's what we studied out last time, is that God's will is good, pleasing, and perfect. And if it's not in your mind, well, you, you shouldn't question God anyway. Amen. But right here, the Bible says, hey, don't conform to the pattern of this world. In, instead, be transformed. And it's very interesting, because the word in Greek right here for the word conform, I, I know that you guys probably know this, but it's shushtamastazai. Yeah. I mean, I, I hear that all the time in your vocabulary. And it means to be fashioned or to be shaped. And so he's saying, hey, don't let the world fashion you or shape you. You know, I think a lot of us think, you know, that the way to be a Christian in this world is to sort of blend in like a chameleon Christian. No. Paul's saying, hey, don't be a chameleon Christian. In fact, uh, one of my son's favorite movies is Curious George. And uh, there's this one scene in the very beginning where Curious George sees a chameleon and he goes in front of the chameleon. And the chameleon turns brown to match his skin. So he all of a sudden just, just gets this idea, and he starts putting different animals in front of the chameleon so it'll change different colors. And so he gets, like, an alligator, and it turns green. He gets, like, a zebra, and it turns, like, stripes and everything like that. He gets, like, another animal, a flamingo, it turns pink. He's like, oh, this is awesome. So then he gets into walking circles around the chameleon, and the chameleon's just, like, turning colors and getting, going crazy and getting dizzy. And I think, man, that, that's how a lot of us are, yeah. is we try to conform to the world. And the standards of the world are constantly changing and we're trying to con conform and conform and conform and be like the chameleon. Right. And it's dizzying. Yeah. It's dizzying. Yeah. Right. He goes, hey, don't conform. Transform yourself. Yeah. The word for transformation right here is the Greek word metamorphosis, which we get the English word metamorphosis. Yeah. You know, like the, the mighty morphin power rangers? Yeah. They, just, they just morphed. <laughs> That's what he's saying to do right here. Don't conform to the world, but you got to morph into being what God wants you to be. Amen. You know, in Hawaii, one of the things I used to get a kick out of is, is people oftentimes would visit the islands that have never, ever been to the beach or have been in sun as hot as the sun is in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And so they get out there, and you can tell who they are because they're walking around uh, town, and they've got the, that red stripe right there on their arm. <laughs> then there's a little gap where the tank top was, and then there's another red you know, section right there, and then there's another strap. And they've just been, have, they've changed because they've been in the sun. And it's, it's obvious who's been spending time at the beach. And, you know, you can't spend time in the sun without it affecting you or changing you. So, too, you can't spend time in the sun, the S-O-N, without it affecting you or changing you. God should transform you. And so you've got to ask, have you been conformed? Or have you been transformed by God's word? You know, a lot of people like to ask, what is God's will for my life? Well, you know, the main thing right here is when you do this, when you allow yourself to be transformed into becoming what God wants you to be, the Bible says then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. In other words, when you've got a tough decision to make, you've got to think, man, how can I be a living sacrifice? Wow. The more sacrificial decision is the more righteous decision. Yeah. And when you do that, God always exposes you to what his will is for your life. Yeah. Let's read on in verse 3. Paul says, for, the, by, for the, by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think of yourself with sober judgment and according with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. 
If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Amen. You know, Paul's admonition to the church is to see ourselves soberly. Now, this can work from two different angles. Some of us, we think too highly of ourselves. Yep. And we need to get sobered out and go, you know, you're not really as awesome as you think you are. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, this is the other side of the coin where the, the pendulum has sort of swung the other way. And a lot of us think too lowly of ourselves. Yeah. And you also have to think soberly about who God has made you to be in his kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. And when you don't think of yourself soberly, it'll affect you. I remember in uh, high school when we were doing driver's ed, we had to put on those beer goggles. You know what I'm saying? And, and you put them on, and you, it's the craziest thing. It just blurs your vision, and you try to walk a straight line, but it's, it's darn near impossible to walk straight when you got the beer goggles on. I mean, when your vision is distorted, your walk becomes distorted. Right. Yeah. So too in God. When you don't see yourself with sober judgment, your walk in Christ will become distorted. Yeah. And you've got to see yourself for how God sees you. Maybe you got to lower the self-esteem a little bit. You're a little bit too confident and arrogant. Or maybe you've got to bolster it up a little bit and go, I've got to believe in myself a little bit more because God believes in me. Yeah. But either one will affect you. It will affect your walk with God. You go, okay, well, what? why is it so important to see yourself accurately? Number one, it will affect your commitment to the church. The person that thinks of themselves lower than what they should see themselves doesn't think that they can help anybody else or doesn't think anybody else needs them. Nobody, nobody's going to rely on me. I'm not going to help anybody out. On the other hand, the one that thinks too highly of themselves thinks that nobody else is going to help them. I can rely on myself. I don't need anybody else to tell me what to do or help me. I, I've got this on my own. Right. And both perspectives are absolutely wrong. Paul says right here, hey, you are a member of the body. As each member of the body needs each other, so to, we all work together in the church. Yeah, we're all different, but we need one another. You with me right here, guys? Yeah. You know, uh, can't help but think how effective a body would be if its arm was cut off. I just imagine somebody walked in here, just sliced off your arm. I mean, that, that, that affect you, would it not? I mean, I dare say that we wouldn't be as cranking as we normally are if we didn't have our arm. So that will affect us. Now, the body would survive. The arm would not. The body can move on without us being a part of it. You with me right here, guys? But if you fail to see your need for the body, you're going to fall off the map. Right. And you're not going to survive spiritually. That's true. On the other hand, the body cannot be effective or as effective without each member being devoted to it. Yeah. You know, uh, when I was a kid, I was uh, basically put in basketball since I was about five years old. And uh, I come from a basketball family. You know, you can see the height right here. But my dad played basketball. He was recruited out to Hawaii to play basketball there. And so we were raised there, and we were always brought up, yeah, this is the sport right here, basketball. And so at five years old, I was thrust into basketball. And, and I understood from a very young age, if you're going to be a part of a basketball team, you've got to show up to practice. And if you miss practice, you, you're not going to expect to play in the games. That's right. And it's, it's just common sense. I mean, two hours every day, peewee basketball practice. And we go, that's, that's just the standard for little kids' commitment to a sport. And then yet, some of us, when we get older, we go, oh, you know, church, that, that's, that's, that's way too, that's too much. That, that's too much. Uh, I mean, they, they want us to show up there three or four days a week. That's too much, church. Come on, bro. Come on in. Come on, come on in. Pee-wee basketball players <laughs> are more committed right. than so many people when it comes to church. Right. Yeah, bro, oh, bro. Now, that cannot be the standard in God's church. On Friday night, we went to go see, uh, with the campus ministry, we went to go see the Son of God movie. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the movie starts at 8. We thought that we'd be set if we got there at 7. We get there at 7, there's already a line halfway out the theater. I mean, just wow. super far out the theater. Wow. I thought, wow, that, that's amazing. Hey, right the movie starts at 8. An hour early for the movie. <laughs> there's people lining up. <laughs> wow. That's, that's some commitment to watch a movie. <laughs> <laughs> and for some of us, for the life, we can't figure out how to get to church on time. Yeah. <laughs> a movie! 
Eight o'clock, we show up at seven. Boom, done. <laughs> Church, 10 o'clock. Oh, geez, 9.45, maybe I should go in that. Got a few minutes. <laughs> There's something wrong with that right here. Yeah. I mean, how many of you guys, if you were got, you got front seat tickets to the Super Bowl, w- would ever think about showing up late? <laughs> yeah, right. right. How many of us would walk in the door of the Super Bowl just kind of hanging our head like, oh. Been a tough week. I don't even know if I want to watch this game. I mean, this guy is taking up half my seat over here with a big old beer in his hand and uh, I got a Super Bowl. I mean, it's the Super Bowl! And we've got something that means a lot more than a sporting event. And we come in, we just don't have a lot of enthusiasm. But there's something wrong with that picture. Yeah, it's true. But it's kind of a cool insight. The word enthusiasm literally means God in you. Th- the, the enthusiasm, theism, God. In is in. So God in you. That's what enthusiasm means. No, that should be fired up. If you really are spiritual, you really are close to God, you should be so fired up to be at church. You'd be fighting for the front row. Fighting to be on time. Fighting to get contribute. But where's the hearts at? We don't see ourselves soberly. Some of us think of ourselves too highly. And then some of us think of ourselves too low. And Paul's saying here, hey, you got to take off the beer goggles because your walk is being distorted. And see yourself the way that God sees you so that you can be effective. What's the second way it affects us? It affects your function within the church. The one that says, I'm too highly, I'm too arrogant, I've got too much. They don't know how to serve because they think they're gifted at everything. The one that thinks too lowly of themselves, they think they're gifted at nothing. And Paul goes, no, 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 no. Everybody's got a gift. And he goes on right here and he lists off a bunch of different gifts. He goes, prophecy. Well, that's pretty much preaching the word of God right here. Serving. You know, I think that's one of those roles that doesn't get a lot of praise. But the church can't function without people serving. Right. Teaching. The teaching's a little different than preaching. Yeah. Teaching is explaining the word of God. And there's a lot of people that explain the word of God. Preaching is applying the word of God and calling people to obey. Yeah. Encouraging. You know, encouraging is a command of God, but there's just some of us are a little bit naturally a little bit better at it. You guys right here? Yeah, some of us, we struggle with being a little rough around the edges. We're not as encouraging as others. Amen. Contributing to the needs of others. You go, well, what, how do I know if I have the gift of contributing to the needs of others? That just means you have stuff to contribute. If God's blessed you with a lot of stuff, then amen. Guess what? You've got the gift of contributing to the needs of others. Amen. Whether you use that gift, that's really up to you. Leadership. People who shoulder responsibility in the church. Uh-huh. You know, in the world, there's the 80-20 rule. That means that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Right. That's not how it is in God's kingdom. No. There is no spectators. There's only participants. Yeah, Showing mercy. You go, what's that mean? Well, that's basically the people that work with those that are a little bit more weak or in troubling situations or in hardships. And they have the patience to get in there and work with them and restore their faith back to God. But you know what's interesting is a lot of people see these different gifts and they go, wow, that's awesome. That means if I don't have the gift of serving, I don't have the gift of prophesying, I don't have the gift of teaching, then I'll just be one of those encouraging guys. And I, don't, I just won't do the other stuff. There's a difference between what's commanded of God and what is a gift of God. And all these things right here are commanded of God throughout the entire Bible. But not all of us are gifted as much as others in these areas. So does that mean that we, don't just, do, we just don't do them? Absolutely not. You still got to do it. I mean, we still got to contribute to the needs of others. We still got to preach the word and share our faith. But there's just some of us that are blessed with a gift with it. And God has put those people in our congregation so that we can learn how to be more effective from them. You with me right here, guys? We're all gifted. And I think you got to look at yourself soberly to figure out what your gift specifically is. But at the end of the day, whether you use your gift will depend on whether or not you choose to make yourself a living gift sacrifice Amen. for the Lord. Let's read on in chapter 12, verse 9. <laughs> now, he goes on right here, and he goes, love must be sincere. Amen. Hey, what is evil? Clean what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. We've we got to stop right there. You know, I think sometimes in God's church, there can be this feeling that there's not genuine relationships, mm-hmm. that, that people are just fake. And, you know, some of us are a little bit less trusting as others, and so we get in there, and we're very guarded around other people. I mean, why, are they, why are they trying to hug me right here? 
You know, the first time you come to church, it's just like, why are they trying to hug me all the time? Well, we're just guarded. Which says that there's an insincerity. And the reason for that is simple. You didn't get to choose who your brothers and sisters were. I mean, when you were born into your family, you didn't get to choose the older or the younger brother. You were born into it by blood, and they automatically become your brothers and sisters. And you just accept it. In God's kingdom, it's the same thing. I mean, who would have thought that Bobby would have me as a brother? Who would have thought that Alicia would be my sister? God has brought all of us together. And we're all different, and we don't always naturally relate to those that God has brought together. But here's the cool thing. When you're devoted to one another in brotherly love, relationships will become genuine yeah. at some point. But you've got to kind of work on it and keep on trying. And it might seem a little insincere, yeah. but eventually it'll become sincere, genuine, deep relationships. Relationships that attract the world to God's kingdom. Yeah. Yeah, right. Verse 11. Now this one's a challenge. Uh -huh. <laughs> Never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual server fervor serving the Lord. Yeah. You know, never be lacking in zeal. Amen. It's interesting. The Greek word for never right here, it, it means never. Yeah. It means never. This, there's no moment in your life yeah. where you should be lacking zeal. Now, I love the, the Revised Standard Version. It says, never be sluggish in zeal. But keep your spirit at boiling point. Wow. <laughs> the boiling point. Oh, wow. I mean, the boiling point of water is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. I have no idea what it takes to boil a spirit. <laughs> that, that's a lot of heat. And it says, that's how you should be. Yeah. Fired up. And yet, as we age spiritually, a lot of us, we, we try not to let our emotions come out. And then to Nicole, what Nicola was sharing right there. We think that, no, 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 I'm not a young guy anymore. I'm more mature. I'm going to kind of make myself more reserved. Never be lacking in zeal. It doesn't matter if you're old or you're young. You're either fired up or you're not. And bottom line, if you don't get fired up now, you're going to be fired up later. Verse 12. Be joyful in hope. Patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, share with God's people who are in need, and practice hospitality. Yeah. You know, I think of the scripture, be joyful in hope. I, I think of Bobby and Kinsky. Yeah. Yeah, it's just funny being around them. They, they always talk about their wedding coming up. Yeah. It, just, it just slips out. They can't help it. I mean, it's, you're talking to me, it's just kind of like, bro, I'm kind of tired of hearing about your wedding. I mean, can we talk about sports or can we talk about something else? But they're, they're just so fired up about their wedding. They got all the hope right there. And it's easy to be joyful when you're hopeful. Yeah. Yeah. But then it goes, be patient in affliction. You go, oh. <laughs> the affliction is it. Don't be less joyful. You just got to be patient. Because sometimes God is going to alleviate that frustration or that, 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 the challenge. And it's interesting. I, when I think about the scripture, patient in affliction, I, I think about the Riveras. Come on, I remember when we first got out here in uh, March 2011, uh, we met them, I think, the same day, the first day of, of service, first day of church. And, uh, you know, they, they had, they, they got four kids, and him and his wife, and they would shove them all into the station wagon, <laughs> this old school station wagon. And they'd drive that thing everywhere. I mean, they were living all the way up at San Marcos at that point, and he would drive every day to work from San Marcos to Chula Vista. Well, about a month later, he's driving the, the station wagon, and the station wagon dies. And I, I don't mean just died and it needs to get fixed. I mean, it, it was dead. It was buried. It was done. And so, I mean, they, they just left it right there. It was like, okay, well, they don't have a car. Family of four. Yeah, he goes, well, hey, amen, it's going to be patient. Catches the trolley or catches the bus or a carpool all the way from San Marcos all the way down to Chula Vista for work every day. Has to walk, I think, a half mile or so, if I'm not wrong, just to get to the carpool because the guy refused to go out of his route to get him. And then uh, they finally moved to La Mesa, so God he gave him a little bit of alleviation right there. And, they, they were a little closer to the trolley, so catch the trolley. For, for a couple of years, no car, four kids. What's awesome right here is that God has finally given them enough money to, to go and buy a car. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Like, oh, that's, that's, that's patient in affliction. That, that's a challenging situation. I got one kid, and that, I still need my car. <laughs> but that's patient in affliction. Yeah. And some of us might be going through a hard time. Hey, amen. Just, just be patient. Yeah. Just be patient. Yeah. It's not going to last forever. At some point, God will alleviate the pain. Yeah. 
But what does it take? How do you stay joyful in hope and patient in affliction? Well, key is the second part or the third part right there. You've got to be faithful in prayer. Yeah. You've got to be faithful in prayer. In fact, in Philippians chapter 4, the Bible says when you pray, there's a peace that transcends all understanding that comes over. Yeah. In other words, it doesn't even make sense. You know, you just, you, nothing changes. You're just out there praying. You feel horrible before you pray. Right. Nothing in your life changes, but you get done, you're fired up. Yeah. Why? Because there's a peace that you go, hey, it's in God's hands. I'm okay. Yeah. You've got to be faithful in prayer. And God will allow you to have patience in your affliction and to be joyful in your hope. Let's read on. He says, and practice hospitality. You know, I think in some ways, one of the things that we miss sometimes with the, the comparison to the first century church is how hospitable they were. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we meet for church in hotel rooms and church buildings and things like that in today's day. But in the first century, they were meeting in people's houses. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was funny. We were studying the Bible with uh, this couple this, uh, a couple weeks ago. And uh, the girl goes, do you guys have a church building? I go, no, we just meet in the Sheridan. We meet in the hotel. And she goes, that's weird. <laughs> She goes, that's weird. Everybody has church buildings. You guys don't have a building? I said, no, we don't have a building. We just meet in hotels. We just can go anywhere we want like that. It's awesome. She goes, that's weird. And people think that that's weird. Yeah. They think it's weird. Well, in the Bible, they're meeting in houses. Right. Not granted, we're not going to shove everybody into Kim Yader's house next week for church. <laughs> yeah, just, we don't have the size for that. We don't have the houses for that. But there is a principle that I think that gets missed in our congregation is that we are to practice hospitality. Right. That means we've got to invite people into our homes, invite people into our lives, yeah. and show them who we are. And then by doing that, you can encourage one another and also win people over to the Lord. Right. But, you know, sometimes we get so frustrated because, you know, we don't want somebody to spill food on the carpet. Or we want to keep things all neat and tight. <laughs> and we just don't want to have anybody in our house. Or maybe you just don't want anybody to see what's really going on back there. <laughs> You got junk all over the floor and your house is trashed. <laughs> well, clean it up Amen. and practice hospitality. Amen. Now, the cool thing is it uses the word practice because I think hospitality for a lot of us is something we've got to practice. Amen. You know, we're not really good at it, you know. People come to the house, they sit down, and we're just like standing around and doing our own thing, playing on the computer. And oh, yeah, there's somebody in our house. So would you like something to drink? I mean, we just got to practice. <laughs> that's, that's why it says that. We've got to practice hospitality. I have a challenge for our married people today. Amen. <laughs> I want to challenge you to have a campus student or a young single over to your house for dinner. Right. And I want you to practice hospitality. Now hold on, hold on. I got a challenge for our young singles and our campus students. Don't be one of those derelicts that goes over to people's houses and doesn't do anything. You get in there and you serve and you receive the encouragement but you make it encouraging back. So there's a mutual edification. Amen. I'm looking out for you, Marys. <laughs> but I want to challenge you yeah. Invite somebody into your home Let them see your life Let them see who you are Let them look at the pictures on your wall about your past Let them hear all the stories about where you came from yeah. Let people into your life yeah. right here. Verse 14 No, I love this part right here Bless those who persecute you Amen. Bless and do not curse Rejoice with those who rejoice More with those who mourn Live in harmony with those with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. I've always said the opposite problem right there. Do not be conceited. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everybody. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. You know, right here, Paul is, is trying to help the church understand what needs to be done when somebody persecutes you or mistreats you. And, of course, we understand in 2 Timothy 3.12 that anyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus is going to be persecuted. Right. Not a question of if, it's a question of when and how bad. Right. But you're going to be persecuted if you're doing what's right. And right here, Paul goes, well, you know, when, when people persecute you, Instead of doing nothing. See, a lot of people think you just do nothing when people persecute you. Paul goes, no, no, no don't do that. That's stupid. Don't, don't do nothing. You've you got to retaliate when somebody persecutes you. Yeah. That's what he's saying right here. You've got to fight back. No, don't just take it. Do something about it. Yeah. Amen. You 
go, okay, well, what do we do? He goes, well, you gotta, you gotta dump burning coals on their heads. I, you can kind of see the guys in Rome getting fired up. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna dump burning coals on everybody. Says, this is gonna be great. And in concept, I mean, if you've ever had one of those hot embers land on your skin, I mean, it burns. Yeah. Could you imagine a pile of burning coals? Oh, no. <laughs> Dumping on someone's head right there? Yeah. Wow. That's what he's saying. Yeah. Anybody who's mean to you, just throw hot coals on them. That's what you do. No, no, no. But no, 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 no. It's hot coals of kindness. No, they're nothing. The Bible says if your enemy is hungry, hey, how about I buy you some lunch? Ooh, now we're getting challenged. And if your enemy is thirsty, hey, how about a 7-Eleven icy real quick? How about we have a cup of coffee and we have a little talk? Wow. Don't, don't, don't do nothing. That's stupid. You got to fight back with kindness. Amen. Now, the, the purpose right here is not to protect your own heart or protect yourself. No, you're a living sacrifice. You've already right. been killed. Right. The, the purpose of this is to win people over to the Lord. You know, don't forget, when we first got married, thank, thank God for discipling. Thank God for the Lord's grace. I, 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 Kelly and I fought like crazy. And I think probably if we didn't have other people in our lives, I would probably be in a body bag somewhere and Kelly would have chopped my head off or something like that. I mean, it was intense. I mean, we were just battling back and forth. I remember this one time. We got into a fight. We were just two or three days into it, and we just could not get resolved. And you know how it is when you're, you're a disciple and you're, you're fighting with somebody else in the fellowship or whatever. It just, it just wears all, it's all over your face. Yeah. And so I went to a midweek service, and I just walked in, and I just, I just had the look of, you know, the, the bitter beer face on you, you know, the, those com old commercials? Just, just angry. Just walked in there and just upset the whole time. And finally, at the end of the service, uh, one of the old disciples pulled me aside and goes, hey, bro, let me talk to you. It's pretty obvious that there's something going on. You want to you talk about it? You want to tell me what's going on? I said, bro, you would not believe it. My wife is so sinful. That is one wicked woman. <laughs> I go, bro, she's got this, and she's got that, she's got cookies, she's doing this, it's just, it's just terrible. He goes, bro, look, 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 bro. Anyway, I want you to go on the way home, and I want you to stop the store and buy some flowers. I said, Poof. <laughs> flowers? Bro, she does not deserve flowers. This is a wicked woman. <laughs> no, she's no flowers. <laughs> he goes, no, no, bro, bro, listen, trust me. You got to overcome evil with good. So I want you to stop the storm by suppose. So I go, all right, man, I didn't want to fight it anymore. So on the way home, I went to the store, and I've got to be honest, I didn't buy the most expensive bouquet. I think I found it the disc discount version of the flowers or, or whatnot. I got the flowers, got in the car, and I was still kind of hesitant to give it to my wife. You know, I was like, oh, we're fighting. This is going to be like me rolling over and giving up. I've got to stand my ground, but i got to get the flowers. <laughs> So I get there, and I pull up in the driveway. I'm just sitting in the car, looking at the flowers, looking at the door, looking at the flowers, looking at the door. All right. All right. So I get out of the car, knock on the door, and my wife just right there at the door. I'm oh, great. I go, babe, I, I brought you some flowers. She goes, oh, baby, thank you so much, baby. I'm really sorry about how we've been fighting and everything. I just want to be right. I want to be resolved. We got resolved like that. That's amazing. That's amazing. Thank God for older disciples. You see, you can win people over with burning coals of kindness. Burning coals of kindness. So don't just, don't just throw the fiery arrows at people. I mean, yeah. let it be burning coals of kindness. Yeah. And it'll be amazing what effect that has in your life. Yeah. But that's how to live daily as a disciple. Let's go to chapter 13, verse 1. Amen. Some of us, we like that part. We don't like this part. Everyone must submit himself to governing authorities. Amen. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Wow. Now we understand God is sovereign. Nothing happens unless God makes it happen or he allows it to happen. Yeah. And right here, the Bible says that every governing authority has been established by, by God. Not, not by man. Yeah, we all do the electoral college and we all vote and things like that. But no, no. That's, that's not who really elects our president. Right. 
God elects our president. That's right. With better guys. Yeah. And I think inside of us, you know, because we're American, we have a tendency to rebel. I and mean, that's how our country was started. Yeah. Yeah. They rebelled from Europe. And so it's kind of in our DNA that we just, we just want to rebel. But somebody tells us to go left, we're going right. And that guy's not going to tell me what to do. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so I think when it comes down to authorities that God has set up, well, we don't like to submit ourselves to authority. But God says right here, no, no, because I set it up, your rebellion towards the authority is exactly the same as rebelling against God. Wow. Let's read on in verse 3. Okay. But rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. So you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and he will commend you, for he is God's servant to do good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on their own doer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. Amen. Amen. So Paul goes, okay, guys, look. Authority is from God, and it's our job to submit to that authority because of, number one, punishment. Yeah. And you've got to admit, you're driving, and you know the cops kind of around the corner. You slow down quite a bit right there. Because you don't want to get punished. You don't really want to have that ticket. Or if, you know, you're talking on the phone, and the cop pulls up next to you, just kind of, sorry, bro, i got to go. <laughs> don't lie and say you didn't do those. But the Bible says right here, not only because of punishment, but also because of conscience, because it's right. Yeah. That's, that's why you obey. That's why you submit to authorities. And right here, I think we need to understand the priority of authorities that God has set up. For a lot of people, I think they have an understanding of authority, but they mix up what authority is higher than other authorities. Right, right, right. Well, one, we need to understand that God's authority is to be submitted to above all else. Yeah. If governing authorities tell us to go against what the Bible teaches, we just ignore the authorities, and that's okay to rebel against. Yeah. With you guys, because God's authority is above all. Right. In Philippians chapter two, the Bible says, "At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow right. on earth, over the earth, and under the earth." There's nothing that doesn't fall under God's authority, mm -hmm. but below God's authority is governing authority. Yeah. The church has to submit to governments' regulations of our land, wherever your country is, or wherever you're living. It doesn't matter whether or not you agree with government. It doesn't matter if you have the same political viewpoints or if you agree with the morality. The laws that government sets up, unless they contradict God's law and God's authority, they're to be obeyed and submitted to. Amen. We go underneath governing authority. Well, what's the next authority? Well, that's church authority. Obey. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, the Bible says, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. You know, I think a lot of us in the church, we can have a lot of opinions. And if you don't think so, then that's just your opinion. <laughs> but somebody's got to be the one that makes the final call. Yeah. Why? For the sake of unity. Yeah. There cannot be unity when people are bickering back and forth about how things should be done and this and that. God has appointed leadership to make the final call. And that leadership needs to be submitted to. You know, um, one of the, the things I, I want to make sure we, we understand is this year as a church, we've decided to take up a 20 times missions contribution. Amen. And that's, that's quite a challenge. Yeah. And basically, for those that are visiting, what that means is that we take our normal weekly contribution, and we multiply it by 20, and we sacrifice that for the sake of mission teams being planted all over the world. Yeah. And it's amazing. I mean, I think this year we're planting several teams. We're planting one in Moscow, one in Toronto. Uh, there's two other churches being planted in the United States. I mean, it's awesome. Yeah. On, that, that's why we do it. Right. Last year and the year before, we took it 15 times around this time, and then we took it five times later on in the year. But what I felt like in that situation is that it, it took away our focus from spreading the word. And we got too focused on raising money and fundraising and things like that. And I, I wanted to make sure that we had a, a good focus on preaching the word. And then we just had one focus on raising money right here. Yeah. And so I said, why don't we combine these two and we'll just do one 20 times contribution. Yeah. And so the hope is, unless there's some unforeseen situation or needs that come up, we're just giving one time this year in May. And that's our 20 times contribution for the whole entire year. Yeah. But that's the decision we had to come to. You might have thought it was better the other way. Hey, man, I appreciate your idea and your opinion. But this is the decision. And this is what we're going to do. Amen, guys? Amen. Well, underneath church authority is family authority. Yeah. Ephesians 5.22. The husband is the head of the wife. He's not better than his wife. But he's in charge for the sake of unity. You know, the husband wants to go to Burger King. The wife wants to go to McDonald's. Somebody's got to make the decision. 
In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, the Bible says children obey your parents. So the parents are authorities over their children, and then the husband is the authority over the wife. In fact, later on in Ephesians, it says, submit to your husband as if he's the Lord. Right. And let me tell you, some of, our, some of the husbands in the church do not look like the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't say submit to them if they look like the Lord. No, no. It says as if they're the Lord. Yeah. As if they're the Lord. Could you imagine being married to Jesus? I mean, you'd be so scared to do something wrong. <laughs> Jesus, would you like any? Uh, uh, would you like any fries with your hamburger? <laughs> uh, I would be terrified. <laughs> Lastly, there's moral authority. Amen. Ephesians chapter five, verse twenty-one. The Bible says, "Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ." And so, sometimes it's not an issue of authority. You're not in an over/under situation. You're just with a peer. And the Bible says, you know what, instead of arguing about stupid things, just go, you know what, go ahead and have your way. Yep. You, you don't always have to have your way. That's right. just, just submit out of clear conscience, out of moral obligation, to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Uh-huh. But you know, I think we've got to get some convictions on what he's speaking about right here and the authority that's being addressed. Submitting to government authorities. Riding the trolley for free is a sin. Yeah. Now, you might think it's, you know, it's, it's for a good reason. I got a Bible study I got to get to, and I don't have five bucks. Hey, it's a sin. Right. No, don't justify it. Speeding on the freeway, that's a sin. Yeah. That's a sin. Yeah. Doesn't matter how you justify it. Well, everybody else is going super fast. I mean, it's a sin. Talking on your cell phone while you're driving, it's a sin. It's a sin. <laughs> and I think this is something we need to embrace. Come on. To be frank, I, I've not done the best job in my own personal life. In fact, uh, a few months ago, we were heading up to D time to Joe and Barton's, and we were a little bit late. Uh, but more so that, I just wasn't paying attention to the speed. And I was driving up there on the 15, and, and all of a sudden, this big old blue light flashes. You know, Chase was crying, and all of a sudden he sees the blue light. He's like, cool, cool, blue light. <laughs> and I pull off to the side of the, the freeway right there, and, and I was thinking for a second, maybe I could come up with some kind of great excuse for why I had to go faster. And I go, you know what? I just broke the law. So the cop comes up and says, hey, do you know what you did? I said, yeah, I was speeding. I just wasn't paying attention. I'm sorry, guys. And he actually let me go. It was pretty cool. Wow. Sometimes God gives you a freebie. But, but, but I, when I told him, I said, I, I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. I, just, I usually travel the speed limit. Uh, I just lost track because we're maybe screaming in the back and things like that. And he goes, oh, okay. And he goes back and does a little research. He finds out that I had been pulled over a year before in that exact same spot. No. <laughs> <laughs> and then what happened that time is I was driving back down from L.A. And I was so tired. I was like, literally trying not to fall asleep at the wheel. And I just stepped on it just to get there faster. You ever done that before? But, you know, it, it doesn't matter how you justify it. Right. It was wrong. It was wrong. And I was busted. But, but we've got to have a conviction. Breaking the law is not just breaking the law. It's a sin against God because God has established those authorities. But we're going to go further on here. Verse 6. All right, here we go. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to govern. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. I just want to lay something out right here. I've heard a lot of disrespect towards our president. Now, I don't have a political viewpoint either way. Uh, Bush this, Bush that, doesn't matter. Obama this, Obama, doesn't matter. God put them there. You might not agree with their political stance. You might not be a Democrat. You might not be a Republican. It doesn't matter. God has established the authority. And you don't have to agree. The Bible doesn't say you have to agree. But it does say you have to respect. Respect. Where honor is given, you give honor. There needs to be honor given. And I've heard people say things about our president and say different political views. Hey, keep your political viewpoint. I'm not trying to change that. But you do have to be respectful and give honor to what God has established here on earth. You with me right here, guys? What's the reason? Because we can win some of these authorities over to Christ. Amen. You know, I, I, I never forget, uh, a few months back, 
uh, you know, Glenn and Tyrone working at Chipotle, and their manager was our sister Ruth. Yeah, she's just working over there, and she was their manager and everything like that. She, she, she heard them talking about God a lot, but she also heard this other guy talking about God. And she got to a point in her life where she's just like, I, I got to go and get back to church. And this guy's been inviting me over here, and these two have been inviting me over here, but this guy's not really living it out. I'm going to go to church with Glenn and Tyrone. Amen. <laughs> she came to church. She loved the church service. She studied the Bible. She ended up becoming your sister in the Lord. Right? But she just won over because of their submission and their hearts to work as if they're working for the Lord. Amen. All right, let's move on right here. Let's get to our last section. Amen. Chapter 13, verse 8. Amen. Let no debt remain outstanding. That's, that's going to be a challenging one for us. Oh, yeah. Except the continuing debt to love one another. Amen. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, do, not, do whatever the other commandments there may be are summed up in this one rule, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not harm its neighbor, Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over and the day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Amen. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual morality and debauchery, not in dissensions and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Living to live again. Right here, Paul, Paul gives an encouraging yet sobering thought to the church. Yeah. He goes, you know, today you're, you're a day closer to heaven. Yeah. Or a day closer to death, whichever should come first. Yeah. And being that you're one step closer, if you're right with God, you should be fired up. Mm. But if you're not right with God, you should be challenged. Right. On the other hand, those that are, are disciples. Yeah. I mean, today... This should be the best service you've ever been to. That's right, bro. And it's not because it's the best sermon. It's not because the singing was the best you've ever heard. It's not because the fellowship was just somehow a super electric today. It's because you're one day closer to getting to heaven. And as we age spiritually, again, we have this tendency to want to reserve ourselves. No, that's for the young guy. Let's just be mature. <laughs> but Paul goes, no, you should be more fired up. Amen. You should be more out of yourself. Amen. You should be more electrified. Amen. More charismatic. Amen. More excited. Amen. More joyful. Amen. Because you know that the day is coming soon. Amen. The night is nearly over. Amen. And the dawn is about to arrive. Amen. You know, never forget, several years ago, uh, we were contacted by a, a, a woman who had fallen away from God and she really wanted to get restored and she had been diagnosed with throat cancer. And so she was literally on her deathbed. We, we, we got the call and Kelly went out there. I think she, she drove all the way down to Chula Vista. Uh, she met the hospital, met her in the hospital there. And it was kind of challenging because the, the family was there and trying to comfort her and console her and stuff like that. She goes, you know what? I, I've got to study the Bible and get right with God. So she pushed the family out of the room and Kelly would get in there and work on some of the issues that she had to work through and deal with and things like that. Her name was Laverne. And it, it got to the point where she was able to get restored. She got restored, and she, she got her life right. She forgave those that she needed to get forgiven. And uh, she devoted herself back to God, even on her deathbed. It was super awesome. Yeah. But I forget one of the things she, she told one of the brothers. is she, she, Right before she passed, little brother he leaned over to her and was going to say something encouraging to her, and she goes, bro, don't ever forget the kingdom is magical. Right. Don't ever forget how awesome the kingdom is. Amen. It's awesome. Exactly. That, those, those are the last things she said to the disciple. How would somebody be on our deathbed be just so fired up? The night is almost done. And the dawn is coming. Amen. Yeah, I, I'm super fired up about Women's Day this Saturday. Amen. I'm super fired up. I'm fired up because we put a lot of work into it. And I want to see it happen. But I'm really fired up because I know what's going to have an impact. I know that the women who, who come out to Women's Day, if they let it, it'll change their life. If they open their hearts to it, it'll, it'll challenge, it'll inspire, it'll make them better women. Yeah. But, but we gotta, we got to get people out there. We've got to get people out of their comfort zone, get people on down to Women's Day so that they can hear the Word of God being preached. Yeah. And I want to challenge the rest of us who, who are not maybe going to Women's Day, the brothers. Let's get people on Women's Day. Yeah. Sisters, you're going to get a lot out of it too. Yeah. But it's really not about you. Get your friends to Women's Day. Come on, yeah. 
Get your family members to Women's Day. It might be their only shot to hear the Word of God. And the night is almost done. The dawn is coming. In conclusion, are you truly worshiping the Lord? Not because you show up on Sunday and sing a song. Not because you like to show everybody how religious you are. But because you have made yourself a living sacrifice. You've embraced the standard of daily living the Bible has laid out. You're living lawfully, amen? Amen. And you're living to live again. Thank you, guys. God bless you all. Amen.